Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session. Uh, we wanted to pull together a panel to talk a, a little bit about some of our experiences over the years as we've all kind of grown into uh, different leadership positions here at Red Hat and, and at other locations. So first of all, I wanted to start off with uh, panel introductions. So my name's Jenna Albertson. I've been in the software industry for about 25 years, but I didn't start there. I actually was an accountant and then was going back to school to get my degree in geology when I took my first computer science class. And I was hooked. Since that time, I've uh, worked for a few, a few startups, started my own company, worked for a few larger companies, and eventually uh, ended up at Red Hat. During that time, I have been a Java developer, a website developer, a team lead, project lead, and currently uh, working as a manager. Um, very excited to kind of share my experiences uh, during my journey with you, and pass it over to Alexandra. Okay. We have this passing mic game. Uh, so my list of achievements is not as long. <laughs> um, so. If, my name is Alexander Federova, and I'm team lead of CI team in Red Hat. And um, if we talk about the starting of a career, I actually uh, got a degree in a completely unrelated topic, which is differential geometry. No one knows what this is. And like at a certain point in time, I decided that I wanted to go to something less nerdy, and so I switched to IT. And <laughs> <laughs> and I started uh, from a very, very lowest uh, level from a junior support engineer in the call center uh, and then like climbed it to support engineer, sysadmin, uh, DevOps engineer, build engineer, CI engineer, and currently CI team lead. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Eliška Slobodová. I also work at Red Hat, uh, have been for more than seven years now. I'm an engineering manager, but uh, Similarly as my colleagues here, I don't have a background in IT. Uh, actually, I finished my bachelor degree in mass media communication and even studied archaeology for a year. Uh, so uh, the way uh, to the engineering and to Red Hat uh, was not super narrow for me either. I began uh, doing part-time jobs uh, of during my studies, uh, first as a translator, uh, then writing documentation, technical documentation, and uh, I would say this was uh, the start of my uh, career in IT in general and later in Red Hat where I started as a technical writer, uh, which was basically just one step uh, to the engineering. Hi, I'm Erica. Erica Von Bulo, I currently lead the auth, as an authentication authorization team for OpenShift. I came to OpenShift and Red Hat through the CoreOS acquisition, where previously I'd worked on the operator lifecycle management as well as Quay for a bit. Previous to that, I think Jessica will be the only one who studied CS. I studied math and found my way over into startup land and where I worked in education technology for three or so years. It was an exciting startup ride from very few to exponential growth every year. That's, I started managing a, an engineering team there when I transitioned over into CoreOS and I became an individual contributor again and unexpectedly found myself back in a team lead role recently. Hi, I'm Jessica Forrester, so I'm also at Red Hat. Um, as Erica hinted at, I do have a little bit more of a traditional background, so I went to school for CS and math. Um, I've been doing software development for, I guess, about 12 years. Um, about 10 of that was spent focused more on front-end engineering development. Uh, went in and out of the team lead position as I transitioned companies. Um, so did it for a little while, changed companies, went back to individual contributor. Um, and then at Red Hat, I've been a team lead. And now I am what we call a group lead in OpenShift, which is a, the easiest definition is a team lead of team leads. So it's kind of like a, an architect for a smaller portion of uh, the product. I 
apologize for the patience as we pass this back and forth. Um, so as you kind of can see, we come from a lot of different backgrounds, uh, different experiences, and we're all at different stages of our career. What we're hoping to do is, as we start sharing our stories and experiences with all of you, that will give you some insight into your journey as you're moving through your careers also. Um, during this, we really hope that people kind of uh, reach out and ask questions as, as things come to you. I'd love to be able to share uh, our experiences on any questions that, that you have. So I, I kind of wanted to start off with maybe something that, that we've all, something in our, in our background that we kind of see as sort of a key uh, turnaround or m aha moment in our careers that we, that we wanted to, to share with everyone. So for me, I had... Uh, I had been a team lead and a project manager for, for several companies, had had a lot of experience with that when I was, and I was working for a smaller startup, and they asked me to move into a management position. I had no, no experience in this other than being a team lead, uh, and I accepted the position, and it was a disaster. Um, I didn't have a, a lot of good mentoring right at that time. I didn't have a, a good role model that I could be looking to for a lot of that management experience that I needed. And at that time, I said, this is, this is definitely not for me. It is not something that I want to pursue. And I left that job and moved back into being an individual contributor. At that time, it seemed like a very good decision, and it gave, but it gave me a little taste of management, working with people, trying to, to handle some of the problems in a different way, and kind of got me started on a path where I was starting to look at that as a possible future for, for myself. Do we all share? Only if you want to. <laughs> so, I guess for me, the the turning point was similar in that I, I got into the team lead position, and when you when I first got into it, it was very focused on the technical side of what it meant to be a team lead, right? Um, making decisions about what which technologies we were using, um, helping coordinate who was going to work on which pieces. But over time, I started to realize the thing that I actually enjoyed most about the position was the people side and getting to mentor people and help them grow and helping them work through whatever might be going on. And I think that's what eventually led me to really want to go into the group lead position because you know, the, the more strategic you get to be, the more you get to advocate for the people that are working with you and your teams. I don't know how much this counts as an aha moment, but just the, it, it, I was reminded I have failed at leading, whether it was managing or team leading recently or any other avenue, many times. And when I'm like mentoring someone on my team, I like if they're not failing at something, I feel like they're not trying, like they're not pushing themselves and I want to push them harder because that's how you grow and that's how you learn. And I'm kind of having an aha moment even myself right now that that's also true of when you're leading, that you kind of fail. And, and it's really scary, of course, because you feel like there's people that you're responsible for. But so much part of it is learning and growing just the same as you would in your technical career. OK, I wanted to bring up a topic that I'm sure everybody has heard quite a bit about because it seems to be in the media uh, a lot, especially in the technology industry. Um, and that's talking about I imposter syndrome. So uh, kind of back to, to everyone here, is, is this something that you personally have experienced? And um, if you have, do you want to share your story and, and kind of your experiences and, and how you've overcome that? This is actually my favorite question, and <laughs> the thing is, uh, I believe I'm not just like experiencing it; I'm also like embracing it and using it to my uh, to my benefit. So the thing is, uh, like imposter syndrome is uh, the feeling that you're not suited for this position, that you're like 
only pretending to feel in this position and there are like real people doing this job and you are just like someone who is not really I I like deserving this, this kind of work. And of course there are like two ways how you can see this and uh, how you can resolve this feeling. So first of all, of course, it's like talking to other people and uh, opening up and seeing what other people think about it, like share your feelings with others and see how others react the same, uh, to the same questions. And you will notice that like everyone basically feels this, the same feeling and it's, you're not alone and this is like a natural thing to have. But uh, the second part of it is, um, especially in my case, where I came from the pure mathematics to the IT and all everyone around like seemed to have a lot of experience already and I don't. And so my solution to the problem of like not being uh, on the same uh, page with others is that I just created my own. So <laughs> the thing is uh, like, I really thought about like being system administrator, support engineer and something, but I realized like I have my own way of thinking of something and I created my job. I actually created my title, this CI engineer thing. When I started to work in the company, uh, I, I was a DevOps engineer and like uh, I spent some time and seeing like, no, I'm not a real DevOps. I'm like only pretending to be a real DevOps engineer. So I just invented my own name and say like, since today I'm not even trying to pretend, I find my own way to do things. <laughs> uh, so I would just add, uh, and I think it helped uh, me in my career as well, uh, it's important to be honest with yourself because uh, everybody has doubts. So uh, like uh, if, even if you have a lot of confidence uh, in most of the things that you are doing, like sometimes you are just doubting uh, what you are doing. And in that moment, I would say it is important to really be honestly able to evaluate uh, your sides, uh, your weaknesses, and also the, the strong sides and try to see the positives and the value that you are, uh, for example, bringing uh, to your team. Uh, so while it is a uh, really simple to find all the negative uh, sides that you have and things that you are doing wrong. It is important to also think about uh, the positives that you are bringing. So really staying uh, honest and true to yourself. I remember when I f my first software engineering job, I was a nervous wreck for at least the first couple months. Like, go home, throw up, so nervous all the time. I think I've gotten better, although every new job or position definitely brings a new round of anxieties with it. Now, the way I try to look at it, I don't know that I will ever get rid of the feeling that I don't know what I'm doing or that I am not qualified. I'll probably always slightly feel those. What I now concentrate on is that even if I'm not qualified now, or don't know what I'm doing now, I do deserve the opportunity to grow and to learn from this. And that I am capable of learning and improving and becoming something good enough to fill whatever the role might be. I guess since everyone else has talked, I will say, yes, I too have had imposter syndrome <laughs> many times. Uh, and for me, I remember the first time someone told me what it was, and it was the biggest light bulb I think I have had in my life, probably, of yes, that is what I have been feeling all this time. And I think once you understand what it is and you can recognize it, it makes a big difference later on because you catch it, you catch yourself doing it, and then it's easy to turn it around. And I think, Alexandra, like you said, use it to your advantage and push through it and get fuel from it. Yeah. yeah, and I know kind of sort of feeding off of that. I, 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 I have suffered from that for a long time without actually realizing that that's what it was. Um, I actually had a, an interesting conversation with, with my manager when I was telling him that, you know, I, I was explaining, you know, you, I'm getting involved in a lot of meetings that, that, uh, that deal with a lot of longer term planning and, and 
suddenly I feel intimidated. So if I'm sitting at the table with a, with a bunch of directors and VPs across the company, it makes, me, it makes me nervous. And then I start questioning, should I even be here? Do I have the right to be here? They obviously all know, know more. And, and it was funny because he said, I feel exactly the same way when I walk into those meetings. And for me, that was a really positive statement to make because suddenly it felt like it's good that I'm not the only person out there doing that. So I agree with what people have said. Talking about that, making sure that you're communicating that with people that you feel comfortable with is, is an important way to get over that yourself and be able to, to understand that if you're being asked to do that, you're being given the opportunities, that it's a great chance for you to be able to embrace that, take, take a chance, and, and believe in yourself because somebody else has believed in you to get you to that, to that place. So talk a, another one about uh, this. So this is one of my personal challenges as I become uh, a leader, and that's uh, delegating. So very often when you're getting moved into a leadership position, that's happening because you, you ha are very good at what you do and people see potential in, in you. The problem is it is sometimes very difficult to let go of those, the, the need to be as successful and do the things that you've been successful for. For me, I've had a hard time uh, delegating, and I tell myself it's because I don't want to burden anyone else with all this work. So I'll just keep doing it all myself. Then I know it'll get done, it'll get done right, and it's not, then I'm not imposing on anyone else. Um, kind of the way that I've been, that, that I have managed to sort of break myself of that is reminding myself of the fact that I have a limited amount of time to get stuff done, so if I am, doing all of the things, that means some of the things aren't getting done. And the things that aren't getting done may be things that are only I can do. Handling one-on-ones, doing some more of the strategic planning, and those are the things that I shouldn't be dropping. And I also look at it from the perspective of, I have, it, this is an opportunity for me to give people on my team a chance to take on new, new challenges and opportunities. And as, so if I am always holding that to myself, I'm not giving them the chance to be able to do that and, and move forward. So you guys have some more? So uh, for me, learning how to delegate was the hardest part of becoming a team lead. So I touched on it earlier that at the very beginning, it was very focused on the technical side of things. And as I learned to delegate and open up more of my time to other parts of the job and the role, that's when I was able to spend the time with the people on the human level and see where they were at and help grow them more. So freeing up your technical side as you're coming up into a team lead position really helps you be a better mentor because you have time to sit back and think about where everybody is at. Um, and once I got really comfortable with, well, as comfortable as you can be uh, delegating, uh, that's when, you know, around the same time, I felt comfortable moving into a group lead position because, you know, the more strategic you become, the less involved in the day-to-day -day development like an individual contributor might be. Uh, so you have to get really comfortable delegating things. That's part of the job. Oh boy, do I feel this one right now. As one of these team leads that she's talking about, uh, uh, there it is. this is something I struggled more with as a technical team lead rather than when I was an official manager. When I was a people manager by title, I felt much more comfortable saying, no, I can't take this on, this is not my responsibility, and very explicitly making sure people on my team owned whatever it was. On, as a technical team lead, I find this much harder because I feel that like I'm supposed to upkeep some sort of technical side, that I need to still be demonstrating my technical expertise. And how am I doing that if I can't even code 100 lines or whatever? It, it, this is very challenging. Uh, but it's good to hear from a group lead that part of it is just giving that up and thinking of things from a more strategic point of view. There are parts to, our, to the technical product that are not about just the code. They're, especially when you're doing systems designing like we are in OpenShift, the code is maybe the least important 
not the least important. It's a, there is a, many other aspects to go on about. So this is a, this is sort of a team leadership therapy session for me here <laughs> of, of learning how to properly delegate. Because yeah, I think you can't, you can't grow yourself or what your team can do if you can't delegate. So before I move forward with any other our questions, does there anybody in the audience that has questions that they'd like us to to answer? Yes. <laughs> Yes. So, so when? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, so this the question was was kind of to talk about from the perspective of as we're moving from the tactical to strategic. What does that personally mean mean to us? Um, so, for me, I think that a, a lot of what has a lot of what has has been different in my career um, as I moved from being that job engineer up to being a manager has been a lot of change in how I focus my time and energy. So uh, when, I, when I was was programming, it was very much about the what do I need to get done now. There's a there's a always a, a list of, of tasks and things that I need to, to accomplish. I'm thinking about things like the training and everything I need to do in order to empower what I'm trying to do right at this moment. A lot of what I focus on now is not so much the uh, the day-to-day -day activities in there, a lot of that I've, I've sort of delegated down to my team, but thinking in terms of where do we need to be in, in six months? Where do we need to be in a year? What are some of the things that are coming down the, down the road that I can see from other teams that might start impacting the stuff that we're doing? So there's a lot more communication, a lot more connection with, with folks outside of my own uh, organization being much more aware of what's going on in the in the industry and and how that may be impacting us and figuring out how I can make sure that I am preparing my team to be able to accept things that might be happening in the future that they may not be aware of yet. Um, so whether it's helping them plan training, helping figure out how I'm growing their careers so that they'll be able to expand out and, and be able to support new projects as they come come up. Uh, there's a lot of different ways in which you're sort of looking at things, but not looking at it necessarily um, on the day-to-day -day or the tactical, uh, in, in a tactical way. I think I, I can talk about totally different aspect of this, <laughs> the same thing. So. Uh, for me, this, uh, so what you were talking about is like how you doing this strategical thinking as the leaders should position while you're there. Uh, what I was, uh, wanted, I, what I want to talk about is about uh, the career growth actually and, and your tactical to strategic idea of how to grow in your position. And the thing is, um, like I met certain people who uh, just finished from uh, from school or some, something, and they say like, "Oh, I want to be like system administrator. System administrator. What should I do?" And then, then they try to reach to that point and so on. And this uh, is like their tactical goal. Yeah, they want to get into this particular position, and they they scope their uh, career growth, their efforts to get to this particular thing. But if you uh, but this uh, scale is really too small, and when you think about your career growth in general, you need to understand like the the life is long, and like in five years there will be no sys administrators and some other like uh, site rela reliability engineers come, and then like in ten years it will be we're maybe all talking to machine learning and, and uh, artificial in intelligence instead of writing our bus scripts, and then like. In 30 years, you'll still be there, and you may be doing some, something completely different. So, from the very beginning, just like you shouldn't limit yourself to one particular tactical goal. You need to understand that you need to invest in a wider uh, scope and, and a wider set of things, which may 
play a role later on. You don't know yet. Don't don't limit yourself to 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 the too narrow goal in this case. Uh, any other questions? Yes. I'm sorry. Motivation? Vision. Oh, what's your vision of a career? <laughs> my, my own personal one. <laughs> um, that, is, that is a great question. And, and I will say, uh, right now, a lot, I would say my vision for, for my career is I'm incredibly happy in, in the work that, I, that I'm currently doing. I love managing teams, and I love being on the engineering side of, of things. Um, so my goal is, is basically to continue to grow my skills in, in helping um, manage my team, understand my, the business better and better, um, and, then, and just to continue to kind of grow in the same direction that, that I've been going in. Uh, but I don't have any real long-term plans for any kind of advancement beyond that, I think, right now. But you guys. The vision for myself or the word that I think of is impact, that I want to be growing my impact on whichever team I'm on, whichever industry I'm in, and on the world at large. That's the motiv largest motivator, I think, for me. I, any, it should, I want to see a, my career growing meaning that I'm having a larger impact on the world, that I am more able to affect the changes that I want to see. Okay, I think I saw one more. Yes. So, as a leader, what would be your advice to someone trying to learn? Okay, so the question was, uh, as leaders, what is our advice for, for trying to find a, a mentor? And that's great, because we were actually going to try to talk about mentors in here. Um, I would say, very often within, within the companies that you work with, there's, there's often programs set up to try and help match people together for, for mentorships. Um, personally, I've had some, some great success in finding good mentorships working through the companies that I've worked for and had some fantastic experiences with being paired up with folks that uh, that I would never have chosen for myself, um, but it has turned out to be a, an incredibly positive uh, engagement. And I've learned a lot from them, I think especially because they're coming from a different um, portion of the organization doing very different jobs than I've done. And so they bring in a completely different insight uh, in, in there. I think that I, I have... I know that a lot of times people look for external mentors. I have never done that and been able to have any success with that. I don't, has anybody else had? No, but I had a different story. Okay. Just, so uh, in my experience, like I have never had official mentor like from a company provided side and so on, but for me, the main mentoring part was actually Fedora community the open source community and it was uh, like there are certain um, issues with that so um, if you go in for mentor uh, looking for advices from a community you need to understand uh, to have a basic understanding to how to differentiate good advice from bad advice because like community is different everyone is different there you need to know your uh, you need to understand to whom to really talk and listen and who are just like doing nothing useful for you. But once you get this kind of habit of understanding how to deal with the people in the community, it provides you a lot of help in this area. So I think there's two points I want to talk to here. The first one is uh, Jen touched on the official mentoring stuff. Um, I have tried that before and honestly I haven't had much luck with that. And I think something that I was told and that helped me is if the mentoring relationship is not working, don't continue it. So when you want to establish a mentoring relationship, you should make sure going in that you both agree on what the goals are. 
And if you are the mentee, you need to be the one to come to the table with what you want to get out of it. And don't put it all on the mentor, because odds are your mentor is probably very busy. Um, and so be ready to say before you guys meet, like these are the things I'm going to want to talk about and give them a chance to prepare. Um, so it, that all helps. You may still find that the mentoring relationship could be three months, it could be a year, it could be a career, and it entirely depends on what the goals are for that mentorship. So the other thing that I wanted to touch on is something that I heard about a few years ago, which is the distinction between a mentor and a sponsor. I don't know if you've, anyone's ever heard of this, but a mentor is usually a, a tactical, I want something out of the relationship because I want to learn something. A sponsor, the best definition I've heard, is someone who advocates for you when you are not in the room. And so think about who in your organization would be that person and make sure you're establishing a good relationship with them because you want to make sure that, you know, when people are saying, well, we need somebody to do this role, we need somebody to do this thing, who would be good for that? Ah, I know, that person. So that's what you want to look for. Apologies for that, all the static in here. Um, so, for anybody on the panel, are you, is anyone involved in any leadership opportunities that are outside of work, or have, have you had some in the past that, that, um, that you want to share that kind of have led you, either that, that are helping to build your leadership skills now or that help bring you into the leadership opportunities that you currently have? So, I mean, this probably isn't too relevant for you guys because none of you are in high school anymore. Uh, but so I actually got started in leadership, you know, very early. I was in our, our marching band, and you know, my first taste of leadership was leading a, a section in band. And, you know, it's, it's not very different than leading a team of people, right? You have to find motivation. You have to plan. You know, this is the same kind of things that you do with leading a team of people in the industry. So. I will represent the, um, there are a lot of different opportunities within open source for leadership. There, I'm currently leading the policy working group in Kubernetes, so if anyone is really interested in policy, come talk to me, and I'd love to geek out about what is otherwise considered a very boring topic, which is one of my advice I would give. If you're afraid of where to go in, go try somewhere boring, because most likely it's not actually boring once you learn about it, but it will kind of scare people off and give you opportunities. So that is one piece of advice of where to find leadership opportunities at open source. The other one is off hours. Very good <laughs> place to find opportunities. Within open source, I find, found that it, half of it is just showing up, and the other half is it, taking on when they need help, just volunteering. There isn't as many, there aren't official barriers of qualifications that you need. So, and if, you, if they're asking, volunteer. It's a very, it's an interesting type of leadership usually within open source because there's actually, I would say, more politics often. So that is in itself a very interesting <laughs> learning opportunity. You definitely learn how to work with people and what the various factions and within the technology are. So that is another opportunity I would recommend people check out. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll share mine. So this is this is a little bit more recent, um, but I had the opportunity to take on uh, a leadership role in running a nonprofit uh, organization that we had started um, to bring girls in, into technology. So it's a it was a high school program for girls so that they could get involved in technology. And I will say it was 
it was an incredible learning experience for me. So even though I was a manager and had been leading teams for a while, this was my first time ever leading a, an entire, entirely volunteer organization. Um, and, it's, and it's a different style of, of management. It's a different way of being able to lead and encourage and empower people to, to work with you. Um, it was incredibly frustrating at times. It felt like I should have been, it, it, a lot of times it felt like I should have had more of those skills I needed in order to make things work a lot more smoothly. But I think there's, once you start changing dynamics, you can learn a lot from that situation, get a better understanding of yourself and, and some, of your, some of your skills and capabilities and also some of the areas that you need to continue to improve on. So for me, it was a great growth experience because one, it was wonderful to be able to, to get out there and, and help uh, run that pro program and, and get that started. Um, but it also it plugged me into a completely new organization and a new way of managing that I hadn't done before. And I took a lot, away a lot of lessons from that that I now apply both to my current job, but then also I plan to use for future opportunities of, of being able to work um, in the volunteer. And I will say, volunteering is a great place to get a lot of leadership experience um, because you don't necessarily have to start off, I did, with trying to run an entire pro program from scratch. Um, but there's the opportunity to be able to step in and take on smaller roles, get comfortable with that, and start building out your, your resume and your reputation. And that gives you a lot of skills that you can then pull back into the workplace as you're trying to look for positions of leadership inside your own uh, company. And kind of since it's related, I, I have a question on uh, talking about building your brand. So I know everybody's probably heard about that, building your brand and understanding what that is. Um, and so, so thinking about it in terms of not necessarily always thinking about things related to work, but how can you build your brand um, even outside of work in, in different ways that, can, that, that lets you help focus the characteristics that you think are really important that you can then bring back into, into the workplace. Um, and so I, I will say for me, uh, it relates to that one of the things that I'm incredibly passionate about is making sure that we're bringing more women into technology and especially impacting uh, kids at a younger age so that, that they become excited and inspired by that and being able to do that. And, and I've done that a lot through volunteering work that I do. So, I, and one of the reasons why it impacts me so much and why it's so important to me and that I want that to be kind of part of who, about who I am um, was I did a training class in, the, in the, some of the schools that we have in, in North Carolina. And one of the things that we did was, a, was we would set up sessions and then we would talk to the kids about what the session was about and they would get to, to decide whether or not they wanted to sign up for our particular session. So I was doing one on computer programming and one of the girls in the class asked the question, can girls sign up for this? And so I used that as kind of my call for empowerment to make sure that I am always making sure that I'm focusing on this um, both at, in my job and, and also uh, in the volunteer work that I do. So you, you guys have any stories on building your brand that you want to share? I will just uh, talk about the technology again, uh, part of it. Uh, so as I said, when we discussed earlier, like uh, for me, the uh, huge struggle was to find my place in the engineering and in like in the, the right role for engineering. So one of uh, so the solution I got to myself is to create my role myself and just create a name for for it. And since <clears throat> since then I'm trying to kind of define what 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 this role means actually. And one of the like work I do in the background and uh, I'm trying to identify what what is this thing which I called myself actually means and what is the theory behind it and uh, how to. Uh, how to create a certain knowledge around it because of the uh, the topic of continuous integration, whatever, is like such a weird thing everyone talks about. No one knows what does it mean actually. So one of the things I'm doing in the background is uh, my ideal 
uh, like my, my dream is to write a book about it. <laughs> but currently, I'm writing just like small pieces. But maybe someday it will it will help. We'll see if it works out. But yeah, this this is kind of a work. Uh, it's not a personal brand, but it's like the brand I want to create and I want to fight for and, and lead in that direction. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would just like to add uh, that, uh, like from my experience, uh, building some sort of a brand uh, is mostly about uh, finding uh, your purpose in life or your career purpose. And uh, it is often a lot of uh, trying and failing. Uh, and also in my case, like when you uh, look at the background and the studies uh, that I've been through, like uh, I've been obviously looking for my purpose in my life. Uh, but I think uh, like after, like in the end, uh, I found it. Uh, similarly as uh, Jen, I would say like, uh, since I'm also a people manager, uh, First, uh, starting as a as an individual contributor, working with other people, and uh, then becoming a team lead, I have realized that uh, this is uh, this is basically the area, uh, the the focus that I would like to have and expand on in the future. So, just keep on <laughs> looking. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, how important is it dependent for you to work uh, on location, and how difficult I guess can be if you're working remotely to to be able to to grow your career in a, in a positive way? Yeah. So, so I will say I'm going to speak on behalf of Red Hat, and then you guys can all tell me I'm wrong. But <laughs> um, I feel like, especially for Red Hat, um, that. that they do a very good job of trying to make sure that we are keeping uh, people, um, giving people opportunities, whether they happen to all be in the same office and local or whether they tend to be remote. And, and I may be speaking more from, from the experience that I have had in, in the groups that I have worked with, but we have a lot of teams that, that have uh, individuals that are scattered all over the globe. And we work very hard to make sure that they are all considered part of a team and are getting opportunities to be able to, to work and, and um, grow into leadership opportunities in different ways. So from previous teams, I, I've managed, you know, the, 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 I've actually had one team where the majority of the teams were all located in one office in North Carolina, and yet the team lead was located uh, in Canada. Um, and that worked out very well. It just takes more time and effort to make sure that you're giving people the ability to be able to work effectively that way. I will say at other companies that I've worked at, it has been almost impossible for you to be able to move into uh, growth opportunities unless you happen to be physically located in the same offices where the majority of the folks were. So I definitely think this is an area that, that Red Hat really excels. So uh, the, uh, my answer would be like it is possible to get into leadership position from remote work and like I'm work remotely and isolated from my team basically for for example but to make it work uh, you need a specific effort so you, you cannot just t take uh, a team uh, put them in different remote locations and start working like this you need additional effort you need additional uh, uh, policies, additional workflows to make sure that a remote uh, work uh, actually works for you. So it's, uh, uh, I saw sometimes that people uh, try to do this remote work by just sending people away and, and, and trying to keep up with the same workflows they had before and it always fails like miserably. Yeah, so you really need to invest your time into organizing it in a remote friendly way for that. I lead my team remotely. Two uh, people are in Raleigh. One of them is here in Brno, and another is in Boston, and then I'm in New York. And I do think it is an additional challenge to be remote from the main kind of center. It can feel, I think the challenge, the biggest challenge is keeping aware of things outside your immediate periphery and 
building relationships, especially with the people who are highly influential in your organization. So I know that there are hallway conversations that I'm not gonna be there for, and that can be, you know, a damaging for your, not damaging, but a disadvantage for your career. It's something you do have to be aware of and really work to overcome to make sure that you're not letting yourself kind of fade away, if that makes sense, but jumping on those video calls as much as possible. This also, I noticed, kind of comes head to head with just growing organizations needing these sorts of skills anyway. There's a point where your organization doesn't fit in a room anyway, and it, being on separate floors is almost the same as being in separate towns. It, the, your team can be made stronger by having a good remote balance that forces you to document things properly to make process that are going to work. So working at it now is a great way also to ensure you have a stronger organization. So the question was, uh, when you build your brand, uh, are you specialized in a certain direction or are you more going into general uh, thing and like trying different things? Uh, I just want to share this story. Uh, the thing is, like, I'm a CI engineer. I was like looking into CI and trying to um, build something about it. But I was also like curious about this you know, Raspberry Pi stuff, and for people who are like deeply theoretical like me, actually making lead light blink is some <laughs> achievement of my life. So <laughs> I actually uh, did it in my free time, and I like created certain like library, I recompiled device tree once, and so, and this actually led me to Red Hat to my current position. So it, <laughs> it was totally out of scope I planned for. It was just for fun. And then eventually it kind of helped me to <coughs> to get into the conversation and to get into the position which I am here now. So, like, you don't have to focus on something. It's good to have primary goal or maybe primary target, I think. But it's also, like, don't, don't uh, skip all these other things you're interested in. If you're interested in them, just do them. It also will help. Yes, I think the official business school thing they tell you is to be a T-shaped person, which is you know broad in many areas and then deep in one area. And I think that's generally good and true, but not great advice, if that makes sense. Personally, if I'm told I have to find something I like or pick a favorite, I blank and freak out, and that will never work for me. That isn't to say I haven't found areas that I've developed more depth in, but it, the way I found that was mostly by spreading my tentacles everywhere, which I still kind of do. Uh, maybe that's not a good thing, but, and certain things kind of you notice, hey, those are related to each other, or that's an area that it seems like kind of has a common, under, that I've heard people talk about in different areas. Is there something here we can learn about? and then just following your interests. I think passion, being passionate and interested in something that especially that maybe doesn't have as big a, like people aren't paying attention to in a more holistic way is a great way to find it and build your expertise without feeling forced to do it. I'll go really quick, because I know Jim wants to wrap up. Um, I, I think for me, being a front-end engineer, the thing that that let me do was I got to actually interface with broad parts of the system. Even though I had a specific technical focus building the front-end, I actually got to see huge, huge sections of the product, and it made it very easy for me to then transition into a broader role because I was then familiar with all of those other areas. So uh, you can 
you can be broad at, at a, a shallower level and then be able to dive into an area when you need to if you get the chance to be familiar with it. And so, I know Jen wants to now wrap up. Yeah, so I just I wanted to thank the panel for doing this and, and definitely thank the audience for all of your questions in there. Um, and I, I hope that some of the stories that we have provided will give you good insights for uh, as you're trying to develop the, your own career and your own career path uh, to a leadership opportunity. Thank you.